Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the Birch reduction which is an interesting aromatic reaction which converts an aromatic compound into a 1,4-cyclohexadiene by reducing the aromatic ring and destroying the aromaticity in the process. An interesting thing here is that we can have two possible variations of our product. One where the double bonds are located uh, next to our substituent and another one where the double bonds are aligned away from our substituent. And that region selectivity aligns with the nature of our substituents. But in order to understand how exactly that happens, we need to look at the mechanism of this reaction. So let's start by looking at the simplest case possible, which is the reaction of the benzene itself with the sodium and liquid ammonia in the presence of the alcohol. While I am not really going to be using ammonia throughout this mechanism almost at all, it is essential for the mechanism and for the reaction because what happens here, sodium is going to shed its electrons and the electron is going to be salvated within the liquid ammonia. Without liquid ammonia as a solvent, reaction is impossible. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to represent my salvated electrons just as an electron E-. Some textbooks and instructors show that as sodium with electron, which is technically incorrect, so I am not going to be doing anything of that sort in this video. Also, since sodium here is going to end up being just a counter ion with a positive charge, I am pretty much never going to mention it again. And so the first step on this mechanism is going to be the electron interacting with our aromatic ring, so we are going to take our double bond, let's say this bond of the the aromatic ring, one electron is going to interact with our salvated electron and another electron is going to stay with another carbon of our aromatic ring. That going to give you the following structure, which is a little bit exotic, but nonetheless we are going to be seeing stuff like that throughout this entire video, so <laughs> get used to that. So essentially what we're seeing here is the anion that I have over here and we have a radical that I have on the adjacent carbon. So technically this species would be called an anion radical. And from this point we can draw a whole bunch of resonance structures and I'm just going to show a few of those, but there is a lot of resonance that you can do with these species. The important thing here to keep in mind though is that the middle structure that I have right over here, that one is typically going to be the major contributor in these types of reactions because we have our anionic species and our radical species being far away from each other, so the electron clouds don't really interact much. Because when those guys are next to each other, both computational and experimental studies show that that is not going to be a very stable type of intermediate or resonance contributor in this particular case, so we are not going to want to have those two uh, species right next to each other. Anyhow, back to my mechanism. So now, when I have my anion radical, I'm going to bring a source of protons that is going to be my alcohol. Typically, we are going to be seeing the third butanol as an alcohol here. However, you can see the versions of this reaction with methanol, ethanol, regular butanol, and some other alcohols. The classic one is done with third butanol, so I'm just going to be writing third butanol here as my alcohol. So the alcohol is going to come in and protonate my anionic part of the molecule, giving me the following intermediate. Now, at this point, I have an sp3 hybridized atom right over here, and I have two hydrogens on that uh, carbon. One hydrogen was there from the very beginning, so if I really wanted to show that hydrogen, I'm going to draw it like that and the other hydrogen came from my third butanol. And of course, in this case, like in the previous case, I can draw some resonance structures, although I'm not going to have as many resonance structures as before, I am going to have two additional resonance structures, and interestingly enough, what we are going to see here experimentally is that when this radical going to interact with another salvated electron that we have floating in our solution, this electron goes here, that electron Electron goes there, they recombine, they're going to give us the following anionic species, and this anionic species is going to catch proton from another equivalent of our alcohol. So I'm going to show that this comes here, 
grabs this proton like so, giving me the final product that is going to be a 1,4-cyclohexadiene in this case. An important thing to remember here is that while in this case over here we could also draw resonance structures showing our negative charge here, where I have in the original structure, here and over here, experimentally we see that the product is going to be overwhelmingly 1,4-diene. And the reasoning and explanation for why that is this way goes deep into the molecular orbital theory, which goes beyond the scope of this particular video, but trust me, there is a reason for why it happens this way. Now, this, of course, was the simplest example possible, but what happens when we have substituents on our molecule? Let's say we have something like this. We're trying to do this reaction with anisole, where we have methoxy groups sitting on our aromatic compound. Well, in this case, we could have two potential options as our final product. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert here. It is going to be option two and not option one. And in order to figure out why, we got to look at the mechanism, of course. So, as before, let's start by bringing in our salvated electron and having an interaction between this electron and our aromatic ring, like so, giving us the following intermediate over here. Of course, in this case, we are going to have a whole bunch of resonance contributors, so I'm going to show one of those, the major contributor where our radical and the negative charge are as far from each other as possible, but another thing that I want want to mention here is that while the negative charge and the uh, radical could theoretically end up on any carbon of our six-membered ring, this resonance contributor is going to be the most stable one because the electron pair that we have sitting on our carb anion and the electrons that we have on our oxygen over here, they are further apart from each other, so they do not have as much interaction. And when we have multiple electron pairs right next to each other, typically that's going to give you an unfavorable interaction, so we want to bring them further away from each other. So now, when we have our major resonance contributor, I'm going to bring in my source of the protons. I'm going to have my anionic part of the molecule grab the proton, and as a result of the proton transfer, I'm going to get the following uh, radical intermediate. Then from here, we are going to have the next salvated electron come in. This goes in, recombines with our electron over here, and we are going to get the following anionic species, which, again, we are going to protonate with our terbutanol, so I'm going to bring the terbutanol in, have that terbutanol provide the uh, proton for my anionic species, and get the final product looking like this. So, remember, whenever you have an electron donating group on your aromatic compound, like, let's say, this methoxy group that we have over here, we want to have our sp3 hybridized atoms uh, somewhat away from that group, because that is where our negative charge is going to be, and we do not want to have a negative charge next to an electron donating group. Now, what if we have an electron withdrawing group? How is it going to react then? Well, let's look at our mechanism. As always, I am going to bring in my electron, and as before, I am going to show the interaction between my electron and the aromatic ring over here, and I will show the major contributor right away. And the reason why this contributor is the major contributor is because the negative charge that I have on this carbon is stabilized by electron withdrawing group, so I can do another resonance structure by moving my electrons over there, which technically would actually be the major resonance contributor, but I'm going to skip that part because what I'm going to have from this point, I'm going to bring my source of the protons and I'm going to use this contributor to grab the proton from my terbutanol like so, giving me the following intermediate over here, which is my red now, from this point, we are going to bring the electron again. We are going to recombine that electron with our electron of the aromatic ring, giving us the anionic species, bring the next equivalent of our terbutanol to protonate that. So, this anion is going to grab my proton from my terbutanol, giving me the following product. But here is something interesting. The co-product that we keep on getting here is going to be the terbutoxide, and 
the proton that we have between this electron withdrawing group that I have right over here and a couple of other double bonds, well, that position is actually fairly acidic, which means that our co-product, our third butoxide that we get here is going to be quite easily deprotonating this position like so, giving us, as the result, a molecule without this proton, which is an enolate species. And now, in order to finish this reaction and actually get the neutral product, we are going to do the acidic workup, where we are bringing the proton from the acidic source, and we are going to protonate our intermediate like so, giving us the actual final product, which, well, actually kind of looks like the intermediate in the middle of this reaction. So whenever it comes to the birch reduction with the molecules containing electron withdrawing groups like carbonyls, nitriles, etc., we often going to mention that we are going to then do the acidic workup at the end to actually give you the neutral compound. So let's do a quick recap here. If we have just the benzene and we subject it to the birch reduction conditions, we are simply going to get a 1,4-cyclohexadiene, pretty straightforward. Now, if we have an electron donating group, well, in this case, we are going to end up with a molecule where the double bond is adjacent to your electron donating group, or alternatively, you can think that your sp3 hybridized atoms, the ones that I highlighted here, they are going to be away from that electron donating group. Of course, when we are dealing with the electron donating group, we generally mean things like alkyl groups, ethers, amines, etc. Now, in the case of the electron withdrawing groups, we are going to have a slightly different situation in which the sp3 hybridized atoms that we are going to end up with, they are going to be adjacent to the electron withdrawing groups, because that's where the negative charge is in our intermediate, and electron withdrawing group will help us stabilize those, or you can think that the double bonds are going to be one carbon away from that electron withdrawing group. And of course, when we are talking about the electron withdrawing groups, we are talking about things like carbonyls, nitriles, nitro groups, etc. So essentially anything that pulls electron density towards itself. But these were all examples where we only have one group sitting on our aromatic compound. What are we going to do if we have multiple different groups? Well, in this case, you need to first analyze what type of groups you have. For instance, in this example, I have the electron withdrawing group, which is my carbonyl, and I have the electron donating group, which is my ether methoxy group over here. Since we are dealing with the negatively charged intermediates in this reaction, we want to prioritize the position of the electron withdrawing groups and make sure that the sp3 hybridized atoms are going to be aligning with where that electron withdrawing group is. So in this case, after the acidic workup, we are going to get the following product over here. Likewise, Let's say we have the next example over here. Well, in this case, again, I have an electron withdrawing group, which is my nitrile. I have the electron donating group, which is our amine, which means that now, like in the previous case, I'm going to prioritize the position of the electron withdrawing group, and I would want my sp3 hybridized atoms to be right over here, which means that my final product in this case is going to be this molecule. And probably one of my personally favorite examples is the birch reduction of naphthalene. Well, in this case, we technically have two aromatic rings. So if we do this reaction on both aromatic rings, we are going to do this analysis twice. In the first case, the aromatic ring by itself could potentially stabilize the negative charge via the resonance, so we would want to have a negative charge what would be benzylic positions uh, towards the other aromatic ring. So let's say this position and this position are going to be the benzylic position to this aromatic ring on the right. So in this case, if I do the reduction of my left ring first, I'm going to end up with this molecule. Now, the turns have tabled because this is now an alkyl group, which is an electron donating group. And this is also an alkyl group, which is also an electron donating group. So now we want to have our negative charge away from those electron donating groups, meaning that I would want to have my sp3 hybridized atom here and here in the final 
final product. So if I continue this reaction uh, in the second round and do this uh, reduction one more time, I'm going to end up with the final product looking like this, which is a pretty fun looking molecule and best of luck trying to figure out how to synthesize it otherwise. Now, remember how I keep on saying that if you have electron withdrawing groups on your aromatic compound, you are going to need to do the acidic workup at the end. So we have the acidic workup here, we have acidic workup over here, because we are going to form an enolate or enolate-like compound uh, as our final product before the acidic workup. Well, what if we replace the acidic workup with, I don't know, reaction with an electrophile, for instance? Well, in that case, we're going to get what we know as the Birch alkylation reaction. So let's say we are going to start with the following amide, and we're going to do our typical Birch reduction. In this case, I'm not going to go through the mechanism, because we have already seen it a million times, but I'm going to show the intermediate, the enolate, right away. Well, now, instead of taking this reaction and doing just the simple protonation, what if I bring an electrophile in the form of this allyl halide? Well, now my enolate can do a simple substitution reaction, simple SN2 reaction like that, where we are going to end up making a new bond of our alpha position of the enolate and the atom where the bromine, my living group, is sitting on my allyl bromide, giving us the final result looking like this. So this way you can potentially form highly substituted six-membered rings with the double bonds that are sitting in kind of odd places, but it might be very useful for synthetic purposes. Now, with all this information in mind, I actually have a challenge question for you. So let's say we have this molecule and we are performing the birch uh, reduction, and instead of the acidic workup, we are doing the reaction with a dichloroethane here. Now, as the result, we are going to end up with the following molecule, which is probably not the product that you were thinking about. Now, my challenge to you is, can you come up with a reasonable mechanism to explain how that transformation has happened? So, let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, hit that like button and subscribe for more. Check out this video next, and I will see you next time.